Next of the Aquatic Invasive Species webinar series, I'm Megan Weber, an extension educator focusing on aquatic invasive species, and I am excited to have Amy Schrank joining us today for our webinar. I'm going to go over um, a few housekeeping items first, and then I'm going to turn it over to Amy for the talk. Um, so we've already started the first bit um, for question and answer. We're going to be using a tool called Slido. Um, I'll have instructions at Q&A, but if you do have questions during the talk, you can also use it at that time. So you can um, either on like a phone or a tablet or another window on your computer, go to slido.com and you'll enter the code cattail um, and there will be a place where you can enter your questions there. The great thing about this tool is you can also upvote other people's questions. So if you see a question that you really want to have answered, um, I, I forget if it's like a thumbs up or something, but you can you can rate it higher and that way it'll come up higher on my screen as I'm asking questions to Amy throughout the Q&A. Um, if you do have problems with using Slido, don't worry. Um, Pat is here to help. Pat is a program coordinator with the AIS detectors team and, and he has um, promise to take anything out of chat and make sure that gets over to Slido so that we still see it during moderation. Um, we are recording this webinar, um, so we'll have that up on our YouTube channel. It usually takes about a week for us to get through the closed captioning on it and to get it up, but we will send an email out um, through Eventbrite to everyone who registered once that recording is up and available. Um, and the final piece, which maybe goes along with the Q&A, is that everyone is muted and cameras are off throughout this. So if you have um, questions, comments, if you have tech issues, um, use the chat feature in um, in Zoom and, and we'll be here to help with that. Um, so I think that's all that I have for the housekeeping side and we can get right to the good part with Amy's talk. Um, so Amy is an extension educator and an adjunct um, assistant professor with University of Minnesota Sea Grant and also at the Department of Fisheries, Wildlife and Conservation Biology here at the University of Minnesota. And we're really excited to learn more about her work um, with hybrid cattail removal for improving fish habitat. So Amy, I'm going to turn it over to you now. Thanks so much, Megan. Thanks for the introduction. And give me one second here to share my screen. Um, hopefully someone will shout at me if that doesn't look good. Um, but as Megan said, I'm talking to you today about whether or not hybrid cattail removal can improve fish habitat in Minnesota lakes. Working with me on this project is Dan Larkin. He's a faculty in the Fisheries, Wildlife and Conservation Biology Department at the University of Minnesota. Um, again, I'm Amy Schrank. I'm a fisheries and aquaculture extension educator with Minnesota Sea Grant. Before I start, it's important that you know that this project's a work in progress. We started in January of 2021. We had our first, we finished our first field season in December of 2021. And I'll be sharing with you a few hot off the press results, but a lot of background and, and overview. Um, our real results really won't be available till after summer 2022. So just so you know, you're in for sort of a cliffhanger with this talk. So um, with that, I will get started. And what I wanna start with is a review of what a healthy near shore lake ecosystem looks like. So in this photo, you can see a variety of plants along the shoreline. You see the occasional cattail here and there. Um, when you move into the emergent zone, you can see this brown tipped plant, um, pretty common in the emergent zone. That's a bulrush, a Sheenoplectus species. These are really common and important emergent plants in near shore zones in Minnesota lakes. As you move out into the open water, you see some floating leaf plants and of course some submerged plants as well. So keep that in mind. Um, when we teach about sort of near shore plants or near shore vegetation zones in lakes, we sort of think of them in this linear fashion. A littoral zone is just the part of a lake where the sun reaches the bottom, reaches the sediment, and that allows plants to grow. So I'm gonna say near shore zone, and littoral zone is sort of a synonym. So we think of this kind of linearly with the emergent plants in the shallow part, floating leaf plants, followed by submerged plants. But of, the co of course, the reality is much more mixed. So you see all these plants mixed together um, rather than in these strict zones. And this diversity and heterogeneity um, variability in this nearshore zone is really important for fish. So from a fish's perspective, when you look below the water, bulrushes are great because they're a narrow plant. They don't accumulate litter year to year. There's lots of space for fish to swim through, um, but they also can be protected from fish predators. 
And then when you add floating leaved and submerged leaf plants, that protects fish also from avian predators. Um, in addition, the diversity of plants in this area provide habitat for fish food, right? Things like bugs and other macroinvertebrates for fish diets. So take home message here is it's, it's the physical and species diversity of these nearshore zones and plant forms um, that's important for fish. So I'm sure you know that most fish in a lake use these nearshore areas at some point in their life, whether it's for spawning, nursery habitat, or even cruising around at sunset to feed. So in, in this slide, you see a couple pictures of larval fish here. Um, this is a brook stickleback ready to spawn and um, young of the year uh, northern pike that we've caught in some of these nearshore areas. In addition to larval and young fish, small bodied species such as the fish you see here spend their entire lives in these near shore zones. So you're looking at groups of minnows here. This is red, Northern red belly dace, blunt nose minnow, golden shiner, really common bait species and common shiner. Um, these minnows are sometimes lumped together as forage fishes are really an important food source for the game fish that humans tend to care most about in lakes. So things like Northern smallmouth bass, walleye of course in Minnesota um, and yellow perch. So Nearshore zones important for fish. What is the deal with cattail? So over the last few decades, lakes in Minnesota and in the Midwest overall have seen increases in invasive cattails in the nearshore zone. So the nearshore zone of many lakes can start to look like this picture of instead of that nice diverse habitat, you see a monoculture of hybrid cattail. And the issue here is the homogenization of the habitat. It changes to something patchy and diverse to something that's solid, um, solid cattail. So I want to back up a little and talk about this invasive cattail and where it really comes from, um, because I think that's something that can be unclear to some folks. So in Minnesota, we have a, our native species of cattail, which is the broadleaf cattail, Typha latifolia. Um, and we also have the narrow leaf cattail, Typha angustifolia. Um, this likely came from Europe, and I'm going to show you a map in a few minutes to show you the, um, the range of, of this non-native cattail. But people are always interested in how to tell these apart. It's not super easy in the field. Um, when you look at broadleaf cattail, you can see that the male and the female part of the plant are touching. So that's that's pretty good for a, for our native cattail. They also have a broader leaf, but that's not any help unless you have a narrow leaf cattail right next to it. Um, narrow leaf cattail is a little bit different. You can see there's a space between the male and female part of the plant. It has a narrow leaf, but again, that's not super helpful. Um, this seems really clear. But what happens when both of these species overlap in range, as they do in Minnesota, is that they always hybridize. And so it can be a little bit more tricky when we're talking about the hybrid. The hybrid is the, is the plant that usually causes the most problems. So the hybrid of these two species is, you know, hybrid cattail, obviously, but the scientific name is Typha x glauca. When I'm talking about cattail through the rest of this talk, I'm talking about hybrid cattail, um, just to be clear about that. In terms of identification, you can see that the space between the male and the female plant is variable. Um, sometimes in a big stand of hybrid cattail, you'll see some um, where there's no spacing like you would expect with a native cattail. So when we talk about how to identify this, it's kind of unreliable in the field. Um, there are genetic methods and of course, pollen can be used to identify the species, but if it grows, in a way that's taking over other vegetation and a big, big clone, and you have clones with variability in space between the male and female parts of the plant on the stem, then that tends to be um, a hybrid, hybrid cattail, but it can be complicated. So let's talk about where it came from. Um, this is a map from a paper by Sue Gladowich et al. in 1999. Um, and this is showing you the, the distribution of both sort of the hybrid and the narrow leaf cattail. So the idea is in around 1860, if people look at pollen and herbarium records, of which there are quite a few um, in the eastern part of the United States, this narrow leaf cattail really only shows up along the edge of the coast here. Um, by about 1949, it had spread all the way, all the way in, and the, the red star is more or less Minnesota. So it spread all the way here. You can see 1967, the sort of right leaning slash marks it spread even further, and currently it, it's continuing to spread. So this this hybrid has been here a long time, and consequently, we don't always recognize it as, as, a, as an invasive species. Um, so that's how it got here. Why is it such an issue? So all the species of cattail have sort of two methods of reproduction. They have wind, wind dispersed seeds. So you've probably all seen the little tufts of cattail seeds that blow around. They also can propagate or reproduce clonally uh, with the rhizome. So 
they shoot this sort of under the ground and then another stem pops up. So this is, this is how they can sort of reproduce uh, clonally and they can sort of take over a large area. Um, the reason that's attributed to the hybrid cattail taking over so many areas is simply hybrid vigor or it's called heterosis. And it's the idea that the offspring of two parent species do better. So an easy example in corn, right? The, the hybrid of these two species grows larger and this seems to be true of hybrid cattail as well. So they have a really rapid growth rate. They get taller. Um, and I love this picture because it really shows you that. Um, these are three average size humans standing in the near shore zone of a lake, Northern Lake Huron. So they're standing in the water. You can see in the foreground, um, typical near shore habitat, uh, near shore plants, um, sedges and a few bulrushes. The darkest back here is trees. And this medium green is a hybrid cattail stand that has been slowly marching across this near shore zone for maybe a decade or two in this particular site. So you can see it's quite a bit taller than these humans and also quite a bit taller than all the plants around it. Um, hybrid cattail also produces larger clones. So you can see a clone here sort of starting to take over in this area. Consequently, large size, more larger clones, there's a lot more biomass. And it's this biomass accumulation that can be a real problem with this hybrid cattail. In some places, um, you know, you get all that standing dead cattail, it gets trampled down. And so you can end up with more of a terrestrial environment than an aquatic environment in some of these places when cattails have been taking over for a long time. Um, just to show you the biomass accumulation, this is an example of what it's like to work in first, um, sort of a, a native plant near shore zone. You can see there's some bulrush, there's some lily pads. It's a nice place. You can see where you're going. You can float your little equipment on the water. Um, in contrast to a really densely invaded cattail area, it's very hard to walk through. You really have to push through the vegetation. It's always taller than your tallest researcher or field technician. It's, it's astoundingly easy to get lost and turned around in a cattail stand. Um, and it's hard to deal with equipment and you get poked in the eye. So different habitat for adults and humans and a different habitat for aquatic organisms as well. Um, we have made conditions really nice for hybrid cattail. Uh, they are tolerant of a wider range of, of water levels than either of their parent species. So as we manage water levels, you know, hybrid cattail are happy. Like most cattail species, it prefers nutrient rich conditions. And we know we provide that pretty frequently um, for plants. And they are also pretty tolerant of saline conditions. So as we add salt to our environment in the winter, um, we might harm some plants, but, but uh, actually hy hybrid cat cattail can do pretty well with that. So you can see that it's, it's sort of primed to take over. Um, what I want to talk about is a little of the background research we've done in the Great Lakes that leads up to the questions we're asking in Minnesota, just to give you a little bit of context um, and reasons for the questions we're asking. So this is just a couple um, slides from work in Northern Lake Huron. What we were interested in was comparing fish and water quality in a sort of native nearshore zone, you can see the picture here, to a cattail invaded nearshore zone. So what's the difference in, in water quality and fish? A pretty straightforward question. And I'm gonna show you two results slides here. I'm gonna show you dissolved oxygen and also show you fish community. Um, so we know dissolved oxygen in the water is super important for fish. And we measured this both in cattail invaded zones. So this picture is here to remind you that it's invaded and in native nearshore zones. So you can see in this graph, we have dissolved, dissolved oxygen on the y-axis and then invaded a native and pretty straightforward. You can see there's significantly more oxygen in, these, um, in the water in these native regions than in cattail invaded regions. But we can dig into this a little bit more and speculate on why this is. Um, just as some background of how dissolved oxygen works in the water when you have lots of plants around. So this is kind of true in wetlands and also in near shore lake zones. So if you look at our graph here, we have dissolved oxygen on the, on the y-axis and then time of day down here on the X. So dawn, dusk, and dawn again. So we see that dissolved oxygen is at a low very early in the morning. And what happens then as the sun comes up, you get photosynthesis occurring and that's right, helps put oxygen in the water. So things like algae and emergent plants and submerged plants provide oxygen. That kind of increases during the day um, as the light goes away, respiration tends to dominate, right? So we don't have photosynthesis going on anymore. And then you get a low at night uh, in, the, in the very early morning and it starts over again. So if we look at those dissolved oxygen data from our study, instead of as an average, like I just showed you, if we look at it across time. So this is just dissolved oxygen again on the y-axis and time on the x-axis. So 10, 11, noon, one, about two in the afternoon. 
Um, we see our invaded, so cattail invaded sites are in black and our native sites are in sort of open circles. We can see that dissolved oxygen throughout the day is significantly higher in these native um, regions compared to cattail invaded regions. This is important for fish. So this is a picture of a mud minnow. Mud minnows are super tolerant of dissolved, of low dissolved oxygen. They can survive in these places where it's low. They can actually gulp air um, and get oxygen from the air when it's super low. But a thing like a yellow perch is less tolerant. And if there's really low oxygen, they're gonna leave the area and not live there. So dissolved oxygen in the water is super important for fish and tolerance is quite variable. Um, so we're interested in looking at this in Minnesota. And to show you what we suspect is happening and what we're gonna sort of look at more in our study, I'm gonna show you this um, aerial photo of one of our Minnesota sites, um, Big Marine Lake. And what we think happens, so I said we have a low in the morning. Um, what I think happens, we think happens during the day is that in addition to photosynthesis putting oxygen into the water, right? You have oxygen rich water coming from these open areas of the lake. And so waves are just moving that water into the near shore zone. When you have all this dense biomass, here's cattail um, in this short arrow, you have this dense, cattail biomass, you're interrupting the waves. You know, waves are not able to propagate that water, the oxygenated water all the way to the interior, like it is when you have a more sparsely vegetated region. So we think that cattail seems to decrease sort of this horizontal lake mixing. Um, and that's something we're interested in looking at in Minnesota. So my last sort of setup as of earlier data, we also looked at fish in our studies in Northern Lake Huron, and I'm gonna show you a quick graph of that. Um, this just shows you fish abundance on the y-axis. So how many fish on average do we have in each type of site? The blue is our native vegetation sites. The orange is our cattail invaded sites. And you can see here clearly lots more fish in these native habitats compared to cattail habitat, more species, a really different fish community as well. So this forms the background for the questions we're asking in Minnesota. We know that cattails seem to be an issue. They decrease water quality. They decrease fish abundance and, and change of the community. But what can we do about it, right? As I showed you, cattails have been here for a really long time. How can, we're never gonna eradicate them. So how can we manage them effectively? And that's along the lines of what we're thinking. So in terms of management, what do we do now? We can spray them with herbicide, which we sometimes do. We sometimes burn them. We sometimes mow them. We sometimes sort of cut them up underneath the water. Um, we know that herbicide and fire can be hard on, things like larval fishes and amphibians in the aquatic environment. Um, and there has been recent data to suggest that small scale cutting of cattail below the water, like you see here in this picture, can yield not only human use benefits, but also ecological benefits. So um, when we harvest cattail below the water, um, it's a good method to present, prevent the regrowth of stems, and I'll, I'll show you why in a minute. But when we go back to these sites over a year, we can see that actually native plants are growing back. So what seems to be happening here is once you get rid of that biomass and you allow sunlight down into that sediment, which contains likely native seeds, which can spend a lot of time in the sediment and still be viable, you're getting that regrowth of native vegetation. Um, so we've seen that in some places in the Great Lakes region. Um, the reason that, um, the reason that cutting cattail below the water, you know, it doesn't kill the whole clone, but it, 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 it really essentially kills that stem, um, cattail and lots of other, um, aquatic plants that grow in the water have, and, and, and sort of out of the water have what are called arenchyma, these holes that allows the cattail to move oxygen into the roots. So when you cut that, it kind of drowns that stem. So cattail will grow in from the side, but they won't ever reshoot up that stem. Um, so channels like this can be advantageous to fish. It opens up more habitat space um, for use. Um, and it could also increase ed edge habitat, which could be beneficial, beneficial for fish as well. And we've tried this in the Great Lakes, but it's, it's, recent, it's pretty um, uniquely suited for inland lake systems like Minnesota because we're already doing this, right? Um, if you sort of zoom out and take an overhead view of a lot of lakes in Minnesota, you see a lot of these channels that people create to let their boats go in and out, to, to have a good view, to access the open water. So our overall question is then, how does small scale mechanical harvesting of cattail stands affect nearshore lake ecosystems? Can this be good for fish and then consequently good for lake ecosystems overall? So um, to talk a little bit more specifically about the questions for our Minnesota study, um, I'll first say that 
this is really relevant to what landowners are allowed to do already. So this picture shows you an example of a, of a, um, a channel cut to get this boat out. You can see there's a hybrid cattail over here and there's some lily pads growing in this channel. Right now with an aquatic plant management permit, you're allowed to get a swath 15 feet wide from shoreline to open water cut so that you can you know, have access to the open lake. So our specific questions are, does cattail removal along sort of within this scale or maybe a little bit larger than this scale increase plant diversity and benefit water quality and fish communities in near shore lake ecosystems? And how does this vary regionally in Minnesota? So we might expect in northern lakes where maybe the seed bank is still intact, we'll see these native plants regrow, but this might be different in southern, in southern lakes. So this leads me to our study. I, you know, as promised, there was a lot of setup here, but this is what we've done so far. So for our study, um, we've selected nine lakes in Minnesota. You can see Rainy and Cabotogama up north and Voyagers, um, some sort of central and western lakes, um, Lake Maud, Long Lake, Beltane, First and Second Crow, and then near the metro, Big Marine and Coon. So what are we doing in these lakes? Um, I'm going to give you sort of our timeline to give you an, a broad view, and then I'll give you a few details. So this is our example lake here. We've selected in each of these lakes within the cattail stands, two sites that are as similar as possible in terms of sediment and, and where they're located in the lake, um, not right next to each other, but separated. And these two sites are 10 meters wide or 30 feet, right? And the reason we chose 30 feet is it doubles the current permit um, that landowners are allowed to get. We thought we'd check, see what us, a sort of doubling of that space did in terms of fish community and plant community. So one of these sites is designated as a cattail retain site, and one of these sites is designated as a cattail removal site. So this past summer, we measured a suite of variables, which I'll talk about in a second, water quality plants and fish pre-cattail removal. So these two sites are the same, right, basically the same in, in 2021. This November and December, this past November and December, we removed cattails at one of these at one of these two sites um, in all of our lakes, and then we will go back in the summer of 2022 measure water quality plants and fish post cattail removal. So you can see we're not going to really find out the answers to our questions until next summer, though we do have some preliminary um, results. So just to dig briefly into the nuts and bolts of what we're measuring, um, you can see again our our lake here, this big green rectangle just represents one of these sites and we'll do the same thing at both sites. We have 10 subplots essentially within each of these, um, each of these larger sites. You can see open water and shoreline and we're measuring a number of ecosystem variables. So first a set of environmental variables, things like dissolved oxygen, temperature, conductivity and pH. And we're also measuring the plant community. So things like species richness, how many species are there? What are those species and abundance? You know, how, how many are there? What, what's the percent cover look like? Um, and we are also at the same sites measuring fish. You can see these have changed to circles with checkers inside to remind me to tell you that we're sampling fish using minnow traps. It's quite difficult to sample fish within a cattail stand. A lot of people put a net outside a cattail stand and, and hope to catch fish that are going in it. But um, minnow traps are really the easiest way to catch them within the stand because the, the vegetation is so dense. Um, and we don't set these just once um, overnight. We set them for 10 consecutive nights and we check them, you know, we check the traps every 24 hours, re count and release fish and then, and then reset them. So that we found the 10 days gives us a pretty good, pretty good sample of what's there and, and can collect any rare species that are around. And uh, similar to plants, we'll look at abundance of fishes, um, species richness, how many there are, that type of thing, what the community looks like. Um, so this is a good point for me to talk about our collaborators. We've had a lot of collaboration with the Minnesota DNR, in particular Shane McBride, who leads the Aqu Aquatic Plant Management Program, and Donna Dustin, who's now retired, um, but was a fisheries research biologist in Detroit Lakes. They were really instrumental in helping us put these ideas together, helping us convene groups of folks from the DNR to figure out where would be suitable sites for these, you know, what are some suitable methods, what, how might this work? So that's been really beneficial um, for our project. And we, we're, we're continuing that collaboration as we work in many of these lakes across Minnesota. We also have a good collaboration with Voyagers National Park. Um, Reed Plum, the biologist there, has been really instrumental in helping our team find suitable sites in, in both Rainy and Cab. 
Um, and they did all the cattail cutting for us. So that was really, at least in Voyagers. So that was really helpful. Um, so it's been great to work there. I also have to, of course, acknowledge the people doing the most work on this project who are our graduate students, um, Brendan Nee, who you can see writing, collecting his data. He's working on the fish component of the project and Mike Tuma, who is working on the plant component of the project. Um, working with them this past summer was Kaylin Schmidt. She's a undergraduate at University of Minnesota Duluth. And this summer was a challenging summer. I mean, obviously COVID, everybody had challenges. We also had drought, which was challenging. So finding suitable sites um, where there was enough water and enough cattail and all those things came together to figure out where we could sample all of these variables um, was a lot of work. And, um, and these guys persisted through a lot, of, a lot of hard trouble to get it done this summer. So now to a few just sort of raw and hot off the press results. Remember our field season sort of ended in December and we're just crunching through our numbers now. So I'm just gonna show you a couple of graphs and a couple of trends that we're seeing. So, and again, this is really kind of raw data. We've got total fish abundance here on the y-axis and these are our nine lakes. So I thought I'd just give you a sense of where we found fish. Um, this number up here, we found about 7,000 fish overall. We collected 7,000 fish from about June to the end of August. Um, and you can see here the blue bars are our control sites and the orange bars are our removal sites. And remember the cattail is still there, right? Those removal sites aren't removed. And the only thing we're looking for by really looking at both of these is just to make sure the fish are kind of in the same order of magnitude, right? This is raw data, not average data. So, so we can say, yes, we're seeing pretty much the same or similar numbers of fish at each of these sites, which is a good sign. So you can see um, these are our Northern sites, Rainy and Cab. Um, our sort of middle sites. You can see there are not as many fish in First Crow, lots in Long and uh, Lake Maud. And then our metro sites, Big Marine and Coon. So just a sense of where fish are across the state. Um, obviously, we're thinking this is going to look pretty different when we look at our, at our removal. And I also wanted to give you a sense of what kinds of fish we catch in cattail stands. Um, so this graph here, again, same thing, total fish abundance. And you can see all the, I, I kind of group these in, in a different way. So some is just one species and minnows here represent a lot of species. Um, you can see this doesn't look like it has any bars, but I'm gonna show you a zoomed in version in the next slide. So right now I'm just gonna talk about the four groups that we found the most of. You can see by and large, sunfish are the most dominant group in these cattail stands. We found the same thing in, um, in Northern Lake Huron. And so when we talk about sunfish, we're talking about babies, right? Because it's minnow traps. So pumpkin seeds, green sunfish, bluegill, the occasional largemouth bass, rock bass, and, and they're hybrids, right? Blue, um, sunfish is hybridized pretty frequently. So, you know, nearly 6,000 of those, lots of those fish. The next most abundant group were bullheads. So things like black bullhead, brown bullhead, tadpole mad toms are in this group as well. So maybe close to a thousand. I will see, I think I have the numbers on the next, on the next graph. The third most abundant were um, yellow perch. This is driven largely like by Lake Cabotogamo where there are quite a few. So this is about 300 or so. And then the fourth most abundant group were um, mud minnows. And again, this is one species. They're not a minnow. They're actually more closely related to a Northern pike, um, but they're small. And these are the ones that can actually get a little oxygen out of the air um, in really low oxygen situations. So I'm gonna show you the same slide, but zoom in to so we can actually see where these bars are for these other um, groups. Um, so you can see I've put the numbers here for the groups I just talked about. So in terms of other fish, we saw banded killifish. Um, again, it looks like a minnow. It's small. These are surface feeding um, fish common in the near shore zone, although not super common to, in cattail regions. We saw about 30 minnows overall across nine lakes. When you go into a cattail marsh, you often see minnows swimming along the edge, but there are very few in the interior. Um, we found that in the Great Lakes as well. Bowfin, this is obviously an adult. We only found small bowfin. Um, we find those commonly in cattails and also the occasional Northern Pike. Again, not this big, but, um, but small ones and you know, 20, 25 or so. So you get a sense of, of what species we find. Um, sunfish are by far the most dominant. And to show you a couple trends, I just wanna orient you to one of the sites as an example so I can show you sort of what we're finding within cattail stands. So this is, um, Chris and Lobeek of, of Macer came out and did some aerial photos for us, which was awesome with the drone. Um, so this is Big Marine Lake. You can see the researchers out here, right? Um, and then this is just kind of showing you the example of control site, removal site. And what I'm gonna show you in the next slide is, is more the zoomed in 
portion of the same area, sort of an overhead view. Um, so we'll look at that. So again, control site, removal site, shoreline, open water, and then you can see the researchers out here just for um, sort of a point of reference. Remember when we talked about dissolved oxygen and how we suspect it's not getting into the interior of these um, areas, and we looked at dissolved oxygen across these across these um, these sites, so from shoreline to open water. And what we're seeing so far, as we would expect, is that dissolved oxygen is pretty low way in the interior, um, and it gets higher the closer you get to this more this edge. So often when you get to the edge of the cattail stand, cattail are just a little less dense. Um, so we're already seeing that kind of interesting pattern. And it'll be more interesting to compare this, you know, control, no removal to, to what dissolved oxygen is like when the cattail are removed. The other fish pattern we're seeing is that in these interior regions close to the shoreline, we tend to see um, sunfishes and mud minnows be really dominant. The only time we ever see minnow um, so the species of fish that comprise the minnow family are in these less dense areas close to open water. So along the edge of a cattail stand, we suspect this is because minnows really are a schooling species, right? Their anti-predator behavior is to, is to form a school and, and try to you know, use their numbers to get away. So they prefer a little bit of more open habitat, that bull rush, um, um, not so dense vegetated habitat. Whereas a sun, uh, sunfish strategy is to like hide in the vegetation. Their body form is built for that. That's sort of what, what they do to get away from predators. When you look into the research of what game fish eat, it's largely minnows. They're easier to eat. They're less spiky, right? So, so if we see that cattail is sort of reducing our population of minnows or forage fish for game species, there might be some ramifications for um, lake fish communities. We saw similar things in the Great Lakes, so I'm really interested in looking at this. Um, and will be interesting to see once we remove cattail, you know, will we see a totally different community? And I don't know, we'll have to, we'll have to find out and get back to you next year. So just a summary of impacts, what we, what we hope and expect to find. Um, first, we want to understand how cattail removal affects fish communities regionally in Minnesota. Um, and we want to determine if, if removing cattail at the small scale, which maybe seems unimportant at the small scale, but if you're spreading this across landowners in lakes, it could have maybe a big difference. We want to know if this is an effective strategy. Um, we hope this is useful for the DNR to help them make landowner per permitting decisions. Um, and one really important component that I want to stress is our public outreach. So it's very tempting to say, yeah, just get rid of all the cattails, it's way better. But, but the point is not that. The point is we want to restore our native plant species because that is what's important for fish. So um, we're really interested in getting the word out that it's this native plant restoration that we're focusing on, not just cattail removal, right? It's cattail removal for native plant restoration. And along those lines, um, Kristen Lobeek with Maycirc has worked with us to develop this great postcard. This is going to be a five by seven postcard. We also share it digitally to sort of get the word out about our project, our project team, and what we're doing so that when our field crews are on the um, boat ramp, boat launch next year, if people are interested, they can hand out a postcard and people can get in touch with us, et cetera. So um, we're excited about that aspect as well. Lastly, talking about future, future research, of course, when you, even when you start a research project, you end up thinking, you end up figuring out a whole bunch of new questions that you'd like to ask, and we have these also. We think it's really important to monitor cattail regrowth. You know, what maintenance is required to sustain these openings? Can you just zip around the edges with an underwater weed whacker, right? Is that good once you've made this initial investment? So that's something to think about. Maybe rectangles aren't the way to go. Maybe circles would be better or a U-shaped channel. So additional removal configurations would be interesting to study. And lastly, muskrats. So this comes from the work in the Great Lakes. Every time you open up a cattail stand, hybrid cattail stand, you'd end up with a muskrat hot at the end. They, they don't seem to do the openings themselves, but once you open them, they really use them. Um, and there's some interest in knowing whether or not they'll maintain these openings. There's some work on that right now in the Great Lakes region. And I know at Voyagers, they're finding muskrats using these openings as well. So as far as we'll get into that this year is we're thinking of putting two, a GoPro maybe on some of these openings to see what's if, if anything significant is using it. Um, but I think that's an area of interesting research. So with that, um, you can find out more at the Maycirc website or at the Minnesota Sea Grant website. And hopefully I've left enough time for questions and I hope you have lots of questions and I look forward to discussion. Thanks.
Oops, there we go. Sorry for that delay. Um, my slides chose to crash right as you were ending. So I'm getting them back up so that everyone can see the Slido code. <laughs> That's fine. So I'll stop sharing. Is that better? Yeah. Oh, let's see. Okay. Apparently my PowerPoint is just done. Um, so um, I might ask if Pat is able to do, to share the slides um, instead. And, but to start with, I'll just say everything verbally so that we can, we can get moving with the Q&A. Um, so the q and I had mentioned is happening in Slido. Some of you have already been in there and are putting questions in and that is wonderful. Thank you. I see some are already getting upvoted as well. Um, you can go to Slido, it's slido.com and enter the word cattail to get into our Q&A. Um, and you can enter your questions there, upvote ones that you're interested in getting the answers to. Um, and we will um, start working our way through those. If you do have problems using Slido, don't worry if you put them in um, chat, Pat can also help get those over to Slido um, or maybe Dan can jump in too since we're also seeing if Pat can get the housekeeping slides up. Um, here we go, thanks Pat. Um, okay, so now when that popped up, it moved my screen. Here we go. Okay, back in the Slido. So now we'll go ahead and get started with the Q&A. So Amy, the first question for you was asking what type of equipment was used to cut down the cattail stems underwater? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, it's actually kind of a more complicated question than we thought. So we, um, it depended on where it was, right? Um, we contracted with um, folks who used a different, different method depending on what it was. So there's these boats which have these different types of cutters on the front to just sort of chop up the cattail underwater. So they use that when they could. Sometimes they had to hand cut below the water with what I think of as an underwater weed whacker. Um, so both hand tools and also these boat methods. Um, in in um, They also have a, the, a thing called a Moby track which helps them get out into the cattails and, and cut it. So there's a variety of methods. And we were initially thinking, oh, should we standardize the standardize this, but what we really wanted to make sure was standard was that the cut, cattails were cut underwater. So um, in whatever method that could happen, that happened. All right, thank you. Okay, so next question was wondering if there's a best time to um, remove hybrid or narrow leaf cattails. So we have typically done it, it, it typically happens in the fall when it's, I mean, I think that's probably the best time when it's sort of fully grown. Um, it's harder to do in the spring when they're just starting to grow. We did have one site, so I would say fall overall. Um, the other thing depends on water level, right? So for example, in Voyagers, there are water level issues where we didn't wanna wait for the water to get too low. So we removed it a little bit earlier than at other sites. Um, the other thing, we have one site where we removed cattail on the ice uh, because it got late in the season. And we we'll, it'll be interesting for us to see if we have to go back there and, and cut below again in the spring. Um, I think that's kind of a different type of method we haven't really looked at. So it's kind of a complicated answer. I would say fall typically, but it depends on water levels as well. Great. Thank you. Okay. Let's see. Um, and then, so how far below the water surface, I guess, with the exception of maybe that ice cut, is it that you're cutting the cattails and are you leaving the roots in place? Yes, we're leaving the roots in place. We're not doing anything with the roots. And really it's just as long as it's below the water. So that's, it's really variable. We don't want the stem sticking up at all. Um, so it can be even just slightly below the water and it depends on water depth. You know, we were cutting from shoreline to open water. So that depth below the water is really variable. When we hired our contractors, we just said it needs to be cut below the water, kind of as low as you can, as low as you can go without disturbing the sediment or the root. Right. Great. And then the rectangle shape that you talked about for the cuts that you were making, um, were you using that for simplicity? Um, was it to mimic that um, channel that you mentioned that's um, available through the permitting process? Um, and then I, th I think you had you touched on this a little bit towards the end about future questions, but do you think removing plants in a more random pattern throughout a large stand might be more useful or practical? 
Yeah, that's a good question. So we chose rectangles because that's what we already do as humans in the landscape. We tend to we tend to we tend to do it that way to make a channel. Um, it's also kind of an easy way to remove it with the with the devices that we typically use. But I do think it's an interesting question to look at other um, other methods. You know, the the other reason for a rectangle is it provides a lot of edge habitat, which can be which can be good for fish. We sometimes think of fragmentation as a bad idea with habitat, but we're kind of in the reverse situation with typha. We, we have this big monoculture, and we're trying to fragment fragment it so that so that there are areas where fish might come in and use it. Um, we've thought of the other thing I think that can be useful are connecting channels. So sometimes, you know, cattail will form a barrier between the open water and maybe an interior marsh that's still native, native, native vegetation. So connecting channels can help. Maybe U-shaped channels can help. I think the important thing is you want um, a connection to the open water right, for, for open water to get in, for organisms to move in, for oxygen to get in. I think as long as you have a, a pretty good connection to the open water, that's good. I think it would be different. It would be interesting to look at making like a circle deep into a stand without a connection between to open water. I think that would be different. I think you'd want to make sure you had that connection. All right. Wonderful. Thank you. Okay. Um, let's see. So do you ever run into floating cattail mats and what would you do in handling that kind of a situation? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, and that came up a lot when we were trying to find sites. So we decided this go around in our first cut, so to speak, um, to just try to do rooted cattail. Um, floating mats, as I'm sure any of you who've encountered them are kind of a nightmare. And I think that's something that might be a next step. We stuck with what the, the best we can with, with rooted cattail. Um, there were some sites where we had some floating mats that we removed, but I think that's gonna be a bigger question. One of the things we're curious about is as we've opened up these cattail, these sort of openings, are we gonna end up with floating mats kind of like, like coming into these open areas and, and what do we do about it? The method for removing those is really different. They use this like cookie cutter uh, machine where they kind of break it up and move it away. So we have not investigated that yet. I think it would be a good next step. Great. Okay. So the next question was um, for people who live in areas where um, the removal of vegetation on the shoreland isn't allowed, is there anything that something like an individual landowner could do to help prevent or slow um, the advancement of a hybrid cattail along or up into their property? So I suppose the best answer for that would be, you know, make conditions su such that cattail don't want to be there. I mean, so that's right. Not making it nutrient rich, although that's probably something at the individual landowner scale. You're, you know, you can, you can manage your own area, but you can't necessarily manage your neighbor's areas. Um, so I think I don't have a great answer to that question. Um, yeah, I don't, I, I can't think of anything beyond trying to be careful about not bringing it in. If it's, if it's not there already, um, that would be my, that would be my best advice. Yeah. All right. Um, whoops. And I think I just cleared a question by mistake. So I'm going to go and recover that one, but I'll go to the next one first. Um, that's wondering if you're including submerged aquatic vegetation and algae in your plant community sampling. And if so, how are you estimating things like percent cover for that in murky water? Yeah, that's a tricky question. Algae, no, we're not doing it. We talked about it. I think that would be a cool next step to look at algae. No one really has looked too much at that um, in cattail stands. Um, we do have some data on nutrients from another study. In murky water, you have to, you have to be careful. So, so what happens often is you just wait till that settles, right? You, we use a quadrat and estimate percent cover visually. Um, and so you really need to be careful if there's murky water to deal with it, wait till it settles um, and find a place where you can see everything. You can also do it a little bit by feel. I know that um, Mike's been working on that as well. Cool. Okay, and I found the question that I recovered. So sorry to whoever asked that, if you saw it disappear briefly, it's back. Um, and the question for that was wondering if you have plans for checking back further down in the future, so five, 10, years along the road to see how long it takes for the cattails to come back. Yeah, we would hope to do that. We would hope to do that. Of course, it always depends on project funding and those types of things, but we would hope to be able to follow this over time um, to see how long it takes for cattails to move back in. And they typically kind of move in from the side. Right. 
Great. Um, and then what is happening to the cut, cut tail, cat tail tops what, during the removal? Good question. And that depends on where you are and what the rules are, right? So, so um, typically we're putting that on land away from water. So, so you don't necessarily want all the nutrients to leach back into the lake. Um, and it sort of depends on where you are and what, um, what land use is around you. So we removed ours away from the water. In some cases, um, we removed it far away, depending on the property. Um, you know, I know what Voyagers, ex they're experimenting with in Voyagers National Park is putting it on shore and then reseeding it with a native plant mix to try and get native plants to grow and then using that sort of decaying cattail as a nutrient source for native plants. So I think that's kind of a, an interesting option. Um, it'll be interesting to see what their data show about that. But it is true when you remove it, there's biomass and you have to have a plan for it to deal with it. So putting it on shore or a little bit away from shore is something that we've been doing. All right. Okay, um, let's see. So the next question was, um, I, I think had to do with the, the management and the way it's permitted, um, but maybe this person can correct me if I'm wrong. There's, they, they're asking, since the hybrid cattails are an invasive species, do you know why the DNR isn't, the, isn't considering them as such? Yeah, so, and, and this, so I have talked to the DNR aquatic invasive species folks. It's, it's a listed as an invasive, and I'm gonna look at my piece of paper here because it, it's called unclassified. It's, so it's invasive, but it's unclassified. Um, so it's that, and, and this is not my area of expertise. So um, it's a different sort of sublisting means, and if you start, if you choose to classify it, then there are more strict regulations around it about moving it around the state, et cetera. But it is considered a non-native species. It's just at this point unclassified, as I understand it. Again, not my necessarily my area of expertise. Great, thanks, Amy. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so then when you are assessing the fish response, are you going to try to determine the edge effects versus effects from the colonization of native plants in your treatment plots? Let's see. Can you read me that again? Am I trying to determine yeah. the edge effects? Yep. So when assessing fish response, will you try to determine edge effects versus effects from the colonization of native plants in your treatment plots? Probably we won't be able to get at that. No, I don't think so. We're, we're just going to look at the fish response and the plant response, um, but we're not going to look at, we won't be able to get at edge effects in this go around. Okay. Um, next question in the list was wondering um, if you're removing all of the cattail in those swaths um, where you're doing the removals, or is it a certain percentage that's happening there? All of it. We're removing all of it. Yep. So it's all in the, in those swaths, all the cattail from shoreline to open water, you know, on shore, there's, there's sometimes more, you know, and, and sometimes what happens is you get this ice berm, right. Which makes kind of a shoreline. And then there's a little bit of maybe wetland habitat behind it. We're not removing that. We're, we're sort of determining a shoreline and then we're moving it, everything um, out to open water. And those tend to be about 25 meters from shoreline to open water, 25, 30 meters. Okay. Okay. Um, next question was the about the fish results that you showed. So the abundance of fish in the various lakes in the control and removal sections. Mm -hmm. And wondering in particular about the rainy lake results, if there's any thoughts about why the fish are less abundant in the treated area compared to other locations. No. And, and so keep in mind with those data, those are raw data. So what we'll do eventually, which we haven't done yet, is sort of take an average of an average of each. And so that'll, that'll bump down that variability a little bit and we'll make sure those are similar. I suspect they'll turn out to be similar abundance in the, in the control and the um, potential re in, in the removal site. So I don't think that difference is going to hold up once we just sort of take the average of the sampling, if that makes sense. Okay. Um, and then can the native cattail species also create the thick stands that can have some of these same impacts on water quality or fish habitat, or is that um, more limited to the hybrid cattail or narrow leaf? It really is just the hybrid cattail. Um, 
native cattail really doesn't grow that way. You know, it, it doesn't in that first picture I showed, you know, that, that native cattail tends to be more, almost more in the, it's, it's in the water, but it tends to be more in the upland habitat. It doesn't grow out into the water as much as hybrid cattail does. So it's really the hybrid cattail that grows in that big monoculture. Native cattail really doesn't do that. It, it plays nicely with other plants is what I always tell people. <laughs> Um, okay, and in your research sites, um, do you have other AIS present? And if so, are you monitoring um, spread of those into the cut areas? Yeah, that's a good question. We do in some cases, in some cases not. And yes, we will keep track of that in our in our vegetation surveys for sure. Yeah, because it, it you know could be you'll be swapping one for another, so it'll be interesting to make sure to see to see what that looks like. Sure. Okay. Um, is there a commercial use for cattails? Good question. And I don't have a great answer, but I know there's, I know that um, there's a group in at Loyola who have looked at pelletis, pelletizing it um, to burn for biomass burning, um, digesting it in a, for biogas. So yes, there, there, there are definitely, I'm sure there is, we just need to find a good way to do it. And, you know, we've, we've thought about in other studies, trying to take the biomass we're removing and using it for some use. One of the big problems is trucking it around, right? So by the time you've trucked it around, your carbon footprint is pretty gigantic. So it's it's such a big mass. Um, you need to figure out how to get it to where you're going if you want to burn it or use it for bio uh, for for a biodigester. Um, the other thing I think, as I mentioned before, Voyager's idea of using it as sort of a starter for native plant recolonization, I think, is is also an interesting idea and might be a good use of that biomass. Yeah, that sounds great. It'd be really fun to hear how that goes. Yeah, yeah. I'm looking forward to their results, actually. Okay. And are you planning to document the native plant revegetation in those spaces as well? Um, and then a question of how long you'll be able to monitor the site for? Yeah, we'll see. For So for right now, we'll be looking at it. We've got it for next year. I'm hoping we can continue, you know, for a few more years to, to monitor those sites. So right now, um, next summer is our first summer, our second, our second and final summer on this project, but we're hoping to actually continue to get funding to, to, uh, to look at it in subsequent years. Great. Okay. Um, next question was wondering about if heterogeneous manual harvesting of cattail achieves better ecosystem benefits than um, trying to do wholesale eradication. So wondering um, if managers should try to cut some cattail to create a patchy near shore environment versus uh, like the clear cut? I guess th that's actually an interesting question because it depends on how, how, you know, what size you're talking about, right? So from the perspective of having a massive cattail stand, what we're creating is patchy, right? So I think, I think within the scale of patchiness, um, because it's so dense, and I think we'll, we'll find out more the answer to this question once we figure out what it looks like, you know, if and when the plants, you know, regrow in, in, the, in the cuts we've made. Um, so I think that question is really, how big of a space should you cut? Um, if you could, should you cut the whole thing? And I, I don't think there's an answer to that. I think, I think what you're gonna bump up against is that that's just too much and, and too expensive. Um, and there probably is some benefit. There's other, you know, other, when you talk to wildlife folks, there, there might be other species that benefit from, you know, dense vegetation stands, um, such as cattail. Um, and I think those are both things, are things you have to take into consideration. So I'm kind of hedging and not giving you a good answer. Um, but I'm hoping our, our results will find that answer. You know, is this too big? You know, is it not doing well because it's too big? Should we study some smaller openings? Um, I think we'll see. Great. Okay. Um, the next question was wondering if you could um, explain how um, cutting just under the surface level and just removing the tops helps or might help affect the fish population since the underwater portion would still be present. Yeah, well, so what happens what happens is you're getting rid of all the biomass, right? So so we're cutting the stems kind of as low as we can to the sediment. So you're you're removing most of those sort of obstacles for fish swimming and also just the biomass that gets in the way of water or oxygen or other things moving into the interior. So because we're cutting it and then removing the biomass, um, we're hoping that's beneficial for fish. We won't know until next summer. You know, the study I was talking about earlier was really looking at um, a native 
vegetation compared to invaded vegetation. We do have some studies where we've cut cattail or mowed cattail and we do find a good fish response. So I think we won't know that until, until, the after, until after next summer. Okay, um, and I think you might have touched on this one a little bit with one of the previous questions, um, but do you, do you have thoughts about um, like large scale hybrid cattail removal versus some of these small scale trials that you're doing? I think it'll depend on what we find. Um, I know Voyagers is working on some more larger scale removal. It's difficult, right? I think that's the main thing you run into is it's it's just logistically hard to do. It's hard to deal with all the biomass. Um, even, you know, if you talk to Reed Plum at Voyagers, he spends a lot of his time removing cattail and it's just, it's just logistically complicated. So um, even if we do see these openings are beneficial, um, I think you do run into logistical challenges depending on who's paying for the removal and, and what land you're doing it on. So it could be that broader scale removal could be beneficial, but it's hard to, hard to do that at the scale of a, a landowner or private land, or, you know, maybe you could do it on some public land, but it, it's still quite expensive. So I'm hoping we get a sense of whether this sort of like 10 meter wide swath can make a difference. And then maybe we hear from voyagers about whether their larger openings are also making a difference. Um, so my thought is that you're gonna run up against cost a lot. Okay. All right. Um, so it looks like the next couple of questions are interested in the muskrat side. Um, okay. The first one was wondering about if there's any indications that muskrats might find either type of the cattails as more palatable as opposed to um, just using the openings. I do not know anything about <laughs> whether or not muskrats prefer the species of cattail. If I had to guess, I would say it doesn't matter to them. Um, you know, it, it's, it's an interesting question and I don't know much about it because I haven't studied it. Um, but I know that both other groups that I know that are doing these types of openings do see that muskrats use them. And so the idea is, could they maintain these openings, right? If you're, or, or can we look at cat at muskrat openings and see if there's some benefit there? Yeah, I don't know about their cattail preferences. I just know I've seen them really use and like hybrid cattail. Sure. Okay. Um, so the next one was wondering if there's things other than muskrats that eat cattail. Oh, this is a good question that I don't know the answer to. I, I, I don't know. Dan, if you know, you can jump in, but I don't know of anything else that eats cattail. I'm jumping in to say that I don't know either. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> Thanks, Dan. We stumped them right, right at the end. Um, <laughs> so what I think I'm going to do, um, there is, um, there are actually a fair number of questions that are left, but we only have two minutes left. So I'm going to take that two minutes to do the final housekeeping and thanks. Um, so Pat, if you're able to advance that slide one more, yeah, thank you. Um, so first of all, thanks, Amy, for coming and sharing all of this information about the project. It's been really fascinating. Um, look forward to hearing about your results as they come out as well. Um, thank you to everyone who tuned in um, to join us and Amy to hear about all of this. We did record today's webinar. Um, so as I mentioned, that will be available on our YouTube channel. That's at z.umn.edu slash AIS tube. Um, and if you're registered, then we will be sending out an email through Eventbrite once that recording is available as well. So you'll, you'll be sure to hear about when that's ready. Um, for questions, Amy did mention that she would be able to take some time to go back into Slido and type responses into the questions that we did not get to. Um, so we're going to get her the information to be able to do that and we can send out a note when there's answers. So for those of you um, who had questions that we weren't able to get to, um, she, she has offered to answer those still. Um, if you have questions for Amy, I do have her email showing on the screen. Um, so you can you can reach out to her there. And if you have questions um, for us um, about the webinars, our other programs, um, our email address is aisdetectors at umn.edu. Um, and I think that is it for our housekeeping items. I'm seeing a lot of thanks come into the chat. So yeah, thanks, thanks again, Amy. It was really great 
having you join us today. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Thanks everyone for your great questions. Really. It was fun to, it was fun to like have a one-way discussion. So thanks for coming. <laughs> All right. Great. Thank you.